All right, well, we're going to continue to look at our study in the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, and we're, uh, we finished up last time on the book, uh, well, finished in the life of Abraham, and we're going to look today into the life of Isaac. We don't have all the details about Isaac that we do of um, Abraham, but we are, um, we're going to look at his life, and really, we just see his life through the life of his children. We're going to look at um, Jacob and Esau in chapter 25, verses 19 through 34. So, if you have your Bibles, I uh, hope you'll turn in God's Word to Genesis chapter 25, and we'll begin reading uh, with verse 19. Um, we're skipping, I guess, over, if you're, if you're following along verse by verse with us, we're not going to read the descendants of Ishmael, which are um, covered in verses 12 through 18, but we'll look at Isaac, because the focus of the Old Testament is on the descendants of Abraham. And uh, so we're going to look at, begin our reading with Genesis chapter 19, or uh, Genesis chapter 25, excuse me, Genesis 25 and verse 19. And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian, of Pandanaram, and the sister of Laban, the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her. And she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came out, came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. But Rebekah loved Jacob. And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage or stuff, that red stuff that you're making. For I'm faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I'm at the point to die, What and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then, then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. Thank you for those who are tuning in or listening tonight. We pray that you would bless them. Bless your word, Lord, not only as we read it and hear it, but as your spirit teaches us the truth of your word. We pray that you would direct us, help us to rightly divide your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we look at this story, it's probably somewhat a familiar story to some of you if you have read through the Bible. Um, you probably got to Genesis 25, maybe, and uh, are familiar with this story of Jacob and Esau. They represent two different ways. Well, they are twins, but you would not know it. And so we're going to look at, there are several differences we're going to look at in this passage tonight. 
the first is there were two parents. There was Rebecca and Isaac. Um, Isaac was 40 years old when they got married. He was 60 years old when they had children. And so they had been married uh, for 20 years when they had children. Rebecca had been barren and not able to have children, and uh, she had not conceived again for 20 years. So we have the story of these two parents and what a, a challenge it is for those who would love to have children and have not been able to. And, well, we see what came next. There were two parents and there were two prayers. They both prayed. Isaac prayed to God on behalf of his wife, Rebecca, that she might be able to have a child. And the Bible says that Rebecca, his wife, conceived. Uh, Rebecca did conceive, but she had complications, I guess, with every new pregnancy there as you go through things you've not gone through before. She says, basically, if you'll forgive my Shelby translation, what's going on? What's happening? And she goes to God and asks him, why is why are these things happening? What's going on? And God explained to her that not only physically were the children um, struggling in her womb, uh, but the the children uh, figuratively would struggle as well. When we first started out in Genesis, we saw. Uh, very early on in chapter 3, that there would be this seed that would come. We have, Vance Abner says, two chapters in the Old Testament. The first two chapters of the Bible don't have a devil, and the last two don't. But between then, there's trouble. And in chapter 3, we find out the prophecy about that seed that would come, the seed of the woman that would come. And all through Genesis, we're looking for that seed, really all through the Old Testament, we're looking for that seed, that one that will come, that one that will be the enemy of Satan, that one will, that will defeat Satan and rescue Adam. And we look for that until the Lord Jesus comes in the New Testament, and now we look for his return. Throughout the book of Genesis and throughout the Old Testament, really, there are these amazing, even to the some points, miraculous births that bring us the salvation story. We talked about Cain and Abel, and then they were given another child because Cain rejected God and Abel was killed, and so Seth came. And then we saw all the generations of Adam, and then Noah came. And we saw the generations of Noah, and then Abraham came. And then Abraham was past having a child, and Isaac came. And Jacob, who was, we'll find out his name, means a, a supplanter, a heel grabber, a trickster. He ran into a trickster that was a worse trickster than he was and his uncle Laban and he wound up with four wives and children and these children the children of Jacob the children of Israel came to fulfill that promise we see the not a miraculous birth but the birth of Moses and the miraculous rescue of Moses and the saving of Moses that he might be the salvation for his people. We see in God's salvation plan, Samuel, who his mother as well could not have a child, and she prayed and she dedicated that child to the Lord, and God used Samuel in a mighty way. We see David, who came, whose great-grandmother was Ruth, a a Moabite, one of the descendants of Lot, who was not supposed to be in the family, but God used her as well. 
and even we see in Jesus genealogy in Matthew chapter 1 we have here in Genesis chapter 25 these are the generations or the genealogy of Abraham the genealogy of Isaac we have in Matthew chapter 1 and in Luke chapter uh, 3 the genealogy of Jesus and we see four if the Ames brothers will forgive me four shady ladies in Jesus genealogy there was Tamar one of well again a Canaanite woman who dressed as a prostitute to trick her father-in-law that those descendants were in the line of Jesus Rahab who was a harlot she didn't dress up like one she was one but she believed James says the messengers she received the messengers and God used her to bring about Boaz to bring Ruth and David he used Uriah the Hittite's wife Bathsheba and all these births that came and even the Lord Jesus Paul says in Galatians 4 when the fullness of time was come God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that are under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons how God uses children and how he uses the birth of those children in miraculous ways to do things that we never thought possible that he could accomplish his will through these people God knows what he will do with that person with that child with that child even before the child is born the psalmist writes for thou hast possessed my reins and has covered me in my mother's womb I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in the in secret and curious, curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect and in thy book all my members were written which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them God knows us before we were born and he knows what we will be and it's so sad today that we're willing to throw that child away before they're even born we don't know what God might do with a child no matter what their circumstances or situation was and how they got here God has a purpose and a plan for that child there were two parents two prayers there were two peoples God says to um, Rebecca there are two nations in thy womb and two manner of people and they shall be separated from you they will come out of you one will be stronger than the other and the younger will be the ruler over the older or the older will serve the younger there are two nations of people two babies struggled in Rebecca's womb they struggled as boys they struggled as men they struggled as peoples as nations Esau's descendants became the nation in the Old Testament it's called Edom and they the Israelite people had trouble with Edom with Esau's descendants they coming out of Egypt they were headed to the promised land and Moses sent messengers to the people of Edom hey let us just go through your land we'll stay on the you'll again pardon my country expression we'll stay on the main road we won't get out and trample your pasture we'll we'll just come along on the high road we won't mess anything up we don't want to bother you we just want to get through here because it's the shortest way and the rulers of Edom said no you can't come through our land and if you do try to come through we'll come out with a sword and run you off we won't let you pass through our land 
And the Bible talks about God remembering that and judging them for that. The nation of Israel is synonymous with the things of God, and Edom or Esau is associated with everything that is opposed to God. Joshua, Saul, David, Solomon, all had trouble with the people of Edom. And even the last book in the Old Testament, in Malachi chapter 1, God says to the people of Israel, I've loved you. And they say, well, how do you love us? I have. God says, I have loved you. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return. And built the desolate places, thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people again whom the Lord hath indignation forever. No matter what Edom tried to do, God was against them, and they would not succeed. They could build the places back, but God would destroy them. Even in the New Testament, King Herod was not really the king of the Jews. He liked that title. He was an Edomite. He was a descendant of Esau, which led even more to his uh, the hatred of Herod by the Jews. There were two parents, two prayers, two peoples. There were two preferences, and we see this in several different areas. First, there was a preference of lifestyle. The Bible says that uh, the boys grew and that Esau was a cunning hunter. Now, if we were picking, we would probably pick Esau. Esau was, uh, they used to use the expression, I think this has probably fallen on hard times, but there used to be an expression, he was a real man's man. I'm afraid a man's man might mean something else today, but he was a rough, rugged person. He was the the guy that went out for sports. He would have been the guy that had all the letters. He was rough and tough and he was he could get it done. Jacob, the Bible says, was a plain man. In other places that word's translated upright, perfect and complete, upright and undefiled. Esau was a man of the field. Jacob was a man of the tents, a man of home. There was a difference, or they were as different as night and day, Jacob and Esau. There was a difference in their lifestyle. There was a difference um, in their love. The preference, not only of lifestyle, but the preference of love. The Bible says, and this is a sad case when it happens any time, and I'm afraid it still happens today. The Bible says that Isaac loved Esau. And it gives us a terrible reason why he loved Esau. He loved Esau because Esau was a hunter, because he brought him, we would say, deer stew. He ate of his son's venison. But it says that Rebekah loved Jacob. We're not told why Rebekah loved Jacob, but she loved Jacob. She was a, I think, kind of a manipulator. She knew all the situations. She knew what was going on. She knew how to move. Uh, Jacob to get him to do the right thing, to move her favorite son, if you will, into the right position. There were preferences of lifestyle, preferences of love. There were preferences of loyalty. And we get into the last verses of this chapter, verses 29 through 34. We have a really an amazing story that's talked about in the New Testament as well. Esau had been out hunting, 
and he had come in from the field and he was exhausted. If you've been out trampling through the woods, hunting, working, and you come in and he was just exhausted and hungry and would have used the expression we use sometimes, I'm starving to death. And Jacob, even though God had picked him, Jacob is manipulating the situation to accomplish his plan or what he thought was his plan. Jacob comes, uh, Esau comes in and says, man, Jacob, give me some of that stew that you're cooking. I'm about to die. And Jacob says, well, I'd be glad to give you some of this stew, Esau, but how about selling me your birthright? If you'll give me the birthright, if you'll let me be the older and you be the younger, I'll, I'll be glad to feed you. And Esau says, what good is a birthright going to do me? I'm fixing to die. I'm so hungry, I'm going to starve to death, literally right here. And so what good would a birthright do me? And so Jacob, I believe, fixes him a bowl of soup, brings it to him, and he says, swear to me that you'll sell me your birthright. The Bible says that Esau swore to him, and he gave him bread and soup to eat. And the Bible says, thus Esau despised his birthright. Esau represents the flesh. Esau is only concerned about the things that, that are Esau's. He's worried about the immediate, what's happening right now. I've got to have this right now. There's a commercial on television that I really can't stand that says, it's my money and I want it now. And that's Esau. It's mine and I want it now. I don't care what the consequences are. I don't care what else happens. I need this right now. And that's what the flesh says. The writer of Hebrews warns us about this. Looking diligently, he says, the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 12, 15 to 17. Lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for a morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward he would have inherited the blessing, or when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. The word profane there means unsanctified or common or not devoted to God. He was only concerned, as I said, about his immediate pleasure. And we see that today in our world, I think. I hope it's not just because I'm old. But it seems like more than ever we see, I want it, and I want it now. And then we do like Esau when we realize we messed up and come back and try to get forgiveness, try to make amends. It's too late. Even though we weep about it, cry about it, may promise to do better, we miss the opportunity. Paul talks about the people of in Philippi, or he warns them, uh, be careful. Uh, the New American Standard has it this way. Brothers and sisters, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of whom I've often told you, and now tell you again, even as I weep, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. So what are the enemies of the cross of Christ like? Whose end is destruction, Paul says. Whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is their shame. Who have their minds on earthly things. Does that sound like any place you know? 
someone who rejects God, their end is destruction. And when they reject God, the true God, their God becomes their appetite, what I want, and I want it now. They glory in things that are shameful, and they only have on their mind earthly things. We have a world full of people like that today. They don't care about the things of God. They only care for the things that will benefit them, not things that will benefit society as a whole. I don't care if that's what's better for everybody else. I want what's best for me. And that's all I'm concerned with. They want it now. And that's Esau. The flesh wants what it wants. And it wants it now. That was what Eve did when she took the fruit. That's what Abraham did when he took Hagar. It's what Moses did when he struck the rock instead of speaking to the rock as he was supposed to. It's what David did when he took Bathsheba. It's what Solomon did when he took so many wives and ruined his kingdom. It's what Ahab did when he took Naboth's vineyard. It's what Herod, not Herod the Great, but one of his sons, we're going to talk about this Sunday in Matthew chapter 14. It's what Herod did when he took his brother Philip's wife. It's what Ananias and Sapphira did when they kept back the money that they said they had given to the church. It's what Demas did. Demas is a very sad character. Paul mentions him in other epistles of Demas is helping me. Demas is helping me. And then in his last epistle, in the epistle of 2 Timothy, he says, Demas has forsaken me, loving this world. He loved the world more than he loved God. All these wanted what they wanted, and they're paying for it. Jacob, however, represents the spirit. Although Jacob was a trickster, a supplanter, and we're going to look at Jacob's life as we go through the book of Genesis, but he at least wanted the things of God. His desire was for the things of God. Jacob wanted the birthright. Esau didn't want it. Jacob wanted the blessing of God, and Esau didn't. And as I said, most, well, at least in part, we'll be talking about Jacob till we get to Genesis chapter 50. We'll focus on Joseph for a time. But Jacob will be mentioned up until the end of the book of Genesis. Jacob was chosen. God had already promised that the, the older will serve the younger. The promise had already been given to Jacob, and yet he tries to manipulate the situation. And we don't need to do that either. Jacob should have been willing to wait on God. We saw what kind of trouble Abraham got into when he didn't wait on God. Jacob should have been willing to wait because God had promised that the blessing, that the birthright would go to Jacob. So as we look at this family, there were two parents, Isaac and Rebecca. There were two prayers that they prayed for children and God gave them children. And there were two nations, two peoples that came from these two children. There were two preferences. Preferences of lifestyle, preferences of love, preferences of loyalty. We have a two choices as well. We can follow God, or we can choose our own selfish desire. It's up to us. And what we choose will determine what we love and what we despise. We uh, went out visiting when I first came to the church, and trying to get people in the community to come out. And we went to this house, and I didn't know the person, but um, they had uh, had been a preacher I had heard before. And we went to their house to invite them to church. 
and he came out on the porch to, I guess, from the look on his face, to prevent us from coming in the house. And he came out on the porch and he just stood and grabbed the deck and just looked. I've never seen somebody look so hateful uh, at somebody before. I couldn't help but think about this picture. Esau was in the family. He was part of the promise of God. And yet he rejected that. And when he rejected it, it became the most bitter thing to him in the world. Thus, the Bible says, Esau despised his birthright. What a terrible place to be in. If we reject the things of God, then they will become a bitter burden to us. So come to Christ. Receive his promise. Believe him. Trust him as Lord and Savior. Don't choose the world. Don't choose the flesh. Don't choose right now. Choose eternally. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for these two peoples, these two nations that represent to us the flesh and the spirit. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to choose you, to choose the spirit, to be drawn, to be led, and to answer your drawing. We pray, Lord, that you would help us not to reject, not to be an unbeliever, that we would not let our appetites be our God, but we would serve you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.